So we've got a Toro time cutter here. Needs a good servicing going. We just got the battery charged up and the choke lever back in on this thing. Uh, now it just needs this servicing. So we're going to show you how to do that. Now this is a Toro 75740 time cutter. It is the same virtually as the SS4200 or the 74720 time cutter. Decks and everything are the same. The front casters are a little bit different and it's got a little bit different of a rim to it, but, and also the adjustment for the speed right there in the middle is gonna be a little bit different. Other than that, virtually the same units. Now this has the Toro 452cc engine on it. Privately labeled Toro, but it's a Lonson made engine, uh, made in China. They've got the Huahi carburetors on them. Uh, I think they come originally with a torch spark plug. Now, this one, uh, I'm not sure if it has a torch in it or not, but I'm not real thrilled with uh, their spark plugs whatsoever. So we're gonna switch that out. And I'll show you everything you need to do to service this unit. See these forks up here are a little bit different than that other one, but uh, functionality and everything on these units, it's virtually the same unit. This one's just a little bit newer. Um, both came in with exactly the same issue, believe it or not. This, uh, Smart speed control is off to the left a little bit more, and the other one over there is going to be just uh, right in the middle. So it's just a tiny bit different design, same functionality and everything. This one's got kind of a little bit newer age uh, uh, operator panel and everything to it, but all the same controls, all the same features, essentially exactly the same unit. So. What we're going to do is we're going to replace the spark plug here, uh, NGK BPR6ES. Uh, we're going to replace the air filter. Now we don't use these expensive Toro or Xmark filters. Uh, the, the engines are made in China to begin with. They're not uh, high quality filters and things like that. Everyone always says, oh, rotary this, rotary that. Well, the reason a lot of these rotary parts get a bad name is the people that are using them don't know what they're doing to begin with. These filters are, are high quality. A lot of them uh, are made for these different companies by Rotary. Rotary makes tons of blades for different OEMs. They make tons of different parts for different OEMs. And they get a bad rap because a lot of their stuff is sold at a cheaper price point. And the people using those just don't know what they're doing. Now this is a 16829. They usually take away the 19 if they're, um, as far as their logging and part numbers. This is a 15181 oil filter. Now, uh, Toro's oil filter is extremely expensive. This one here, about the same thing. Good quality, not expensive at all. We use an Oregon 07-122 filter on these. Now you can use some different parts if you want, um, however you'd like to do it. But the first thing we like to do is go ahead and drain the oil. Now over here you've got an oil drain where you can use a tube and try to come out beside the frame on these. We don't do that. We take an extractor and we take it out of the top. Now the oil in this doesn't look too bad at all, but we're gonna get that suction going real quick and get that drained. This extractor is about full. Hopefully it has enough room for another, I don't know, probably quart and a half or so in here. I think that's about what they take. So these are good to invest in if you're going to be servicing your own unit. They just pull the oil right out of the top. We like this one. It's made by OEM Tools. See if I could find the front. So it's made by OEM Tools. I like it because it's all one solid um, container. It doesn't have two different pieces. We've had some leaking at the bottoms of some of the other ones, which definitely isn't good. So while we drain the oil again you can use this quick drain at the bottom if you've got a hose to run out it doesn't seem to work quite as well if you run the hose out to the back it just seems to get everywhere this quick change the o-rings inside do go bad quite a bit but to to change the oil all you've got to do is twist and pull straight out now you want to pay attention here because a lot of times the base where it screws into the engine will get loose now this one seems plenty tight but if that's loose at all when you try to turn this out it's going to back out your oil drain a little bit. You wanna make sure that that's tightened up plenty tight in order to make sure you don't have an oil leak and start losing oil on the thing. Now these have releases for the hydros and back. Just wanted to point that out, both sides. If you wanna push it, which is what we've got it in. Oh, no we don't. If you wanna push it, you just push it in and latch it to the bottom 
and that gets you able to freewheel. We've got it out into drive mode now. Spark plug, taking it out. Now these are hard to get out a lot of times. If you have an issue getting that out of there, now I thought, yeah, this definitely, definitely the wrong spark plug. Somebody's got a, yeah, somebody's got a champion plug in this thing. Definitely not the right plug. So we're gonna grab, we're gonna grab a 5 8 socket to pull it out. We're gonna put the right plug in it. So it looks like somebody's done a tune-up or something to this at some point and put a different size plug in it. Now, uh, it looks to me like it's an RC12YC, which depth and functionality is gonna be the same. Uh, they're, the head on them is just a little bit different. I don't know if the heat range is the same or not. Can't remember off the top of my head, but that oil just drained out real quick. Now this oil is not hot whatsoever. It seems like it was kind of thin. So yeah, this is an RC12YC. Looks almost new. Doesn't look like it's hardly been used at all. Put the right plug back in it. And again, that's a BPR6ES made by NGK. A lot of times, again, I believe they come with the torch spark plugs in them. Now, once you get that uh, wire off of there, if you have a hard time getting it off, I'll show you how how to kind of pry against it. And we're using a 13 16 uh, or 21 millimeter either way. We'll get that plug out and get you a new one in. Snug that up real nice. Definitely don't want it loose. Don't want to over tighten it either, but okay. You just want to pop that straight down on there. You know, I may be wrong about this. This might take. Hmm. That's strange. I thought for sure it takes the BPR 5ES or 6ES. I'm sorry. It looks like on this thing, the plug that was in it is the right one. The way you can tell on this, I've done quite a few of these engines and I haven't seen anything call for a spec on this. I'll look it up real quick, but that's not actually gonna fit in there because the base isn't going to push over the flared end. So that's definitely not the right plug. They've got the right plug in it, it, it looks like, so. We're going to get, instead of the BPR5ES or BPR6ES, we're going to get a 491055T. So that's Briggs & Stratton's version of the RC12YC. I have a lot better luck with these plugs than I do the Champions. I had a batch of Champion plugs that were bad right when I first started doing this. And ever since, I just never have been a Champion person. We've got a few miscellaneous plugs laying around from champion but i don't know you'll talk to a lot of the old heads which will tell you one plug or the other they either it's usually they're either champion guys or ngk guys uh usually don't get a whole lot of other people but sometimes you get people who like to run you know the homeowner say oh yeah i love the e3 plugs uh, we have so many problems with e3 plugs it's not even funny all right now it snaps in there nice and good so again functionality wise of these as far as the depth and everything they go is going to be the same i believe the heat range is also the same but the bpr 6es as i'm sure these engines normally take these a lot of them do i wonder what the other one takes over here just to kind of give a comparison i know a lot of them do take those bpr 6es's so why don't we go ahead and Nope, that's got the smaller plug into it also. So maybe I've been uh, maybe I've been mistaken about that, but I thought these newer Lonson engines took that. Anyway, let's go ahead and move on to the next thing. What we want to do is go ahead and replace the air filter at this point. Now, to get that plug out, you're going to want a 16 millimeter or a 5/8, as opposed to the other size I mentioned, because it's going to be different. Again, the extractor is a great thing to have. It's gonna help you out a lot from not spilling oil all over the place. If you plan on doing continued service on it, invest in one. I think those are, 
seventy dollars or eighty dollars maybe well worth the investment you can use it for just about anything <sighs> I'm clean all that out if there's a bunch of debris in there you can blow everything out afterwards that's what we're gonna do go ahead and get this uh, rotary filter in there now weight wise and quality wise and everything on these they're pretty well the same I don't have any quality issues with them whatsoever they make a good filter just push that straight down on top you want to make sure the notch goes towards the carbureted issue or towards the carburetor on this side when you're putting it back in all right you just screw those down nice and snug and from there what we want to do is go ahead and go to the oil filter now that we've got all the oil drained out Got the oil filter right down here what I like to do normally is put a uh, rag down below and I'll show you how to remove that filter without making too big of a mess now it seems like you're always gonna make some sort of a mess when you're doing a uh, oil change on just about anything but when you get used to it if you shove just a rag down below so just right underneath it that'll and if you get it up and back just a little bit that'll catch the majority of what falls at this point i like to use a big pair of ice grips to get these off they just seem better than anything else and this is a 12 inch pair now i just knock that choke lever out of there as i was doing that this is actually what we fixed in the last video we just did that choke lever seems to pop out pretty easy so i'm going to try not to not to hit that again if at all possible let's go from the back side pretty ironic i just hit that and it popped right out just with the tiny little shows how easy that is to pop out of there now if you pop it out you can watch that other video and kind of show you how to put it back in and hmm. all right these big vice grips just help so much with really any oil filter all right just helps you get it loose and once you get it loose you can go ahead and twist it off the rest of the way i like to do it real quick as soon as it breaks free all right flip it upside down hold as much of the rest of the oil in it as you can So there we didn't really get much all over the place just a little bit at the bottom wipe all that up now normally what we'll do is we'll pressure wash our units after we're done with them let them sit for half an hour or so start them up tag them and then we'll move them outside and then we start everything the next morning no matter the situation just to make sure everything's good got a little spot over it here got some good oil here i'm going to go ahead and rub that just all around the gasket on here all right and then we're gonna screw that right on still a little oil dripping out no big deal got another rag now we always mark our filters we usually use the date and then ind repair and then we always initial them just to make sure something happens they back out or anything like that we know who did it we know who to talk to about making sure they make some adjustments we don't have those issues anymore but towards the beginning of uh of the company there were a few of those here and there where you know you had questions and you just learned if you were gonna know exactly what was going on that was the best way to do things next we've got the fuel filter up top here get the uh, camera to go into a good spot all right i'll flip the seat forward at this point and this is again a uh, oregon 07-122 filter all we're going to do is open it and grab our filter coming up take the tab off either side and what I like to do is grab at the at the end here and turn 
and it usually comes free. I like to free up both ends first, just kind of get them almost all the way off, and then I'll grab the input side, the side going towards the tank, and I'll take it completely up. Go ahead and put the new filter on, and then that one was almost loose to begin with. Put the new one on, so we've got that all free. Toss it away. Onto the floor, apparently, is the best place for it right now. Now, you do want to pay attention as you've got these off. If you look down at your lines here, if you've got any cracking or dry rotting or anything like that, you want to address that while it's off. If you don't address that right now, you're going to get leaking here. Uh, and a lot of times with these fuel lines, they're a little bit inferior in my mind. Uh, they can collapse and stuff on each other and uh, cause that to suction together and stop providing fuel at some point. It'll cause you issues down the road, so just make sure you pay attention to that. You can snip them back a little bit if it's just a little uh, cracking or dry rotting at the end. That's not a big deal whatsoever, but if it's real bad and they're starting to separate or anything like that, you do want to make sure you get that fuel line replaced. Don't leave it like that. And wipe up all that gas. You don't want to leave it there. It does hurt the paint for sure. From there, all we need really for the engine left is going to be some oil. We'll throw a little bit of oil in it. Uh, no big deal. I'll grab some oil here real quick and we'll finish up this tune-up. So we're going to add some oil. Got a couple quarts here. We use a uh, 10W30 synthetic blend is what we use. Now, depending on where you're at, you may use something else. 10W30, I would say, is definitely the most common, though. As far as what you should be running in these good for a little warmer of a uh, temperature range some motors actually call for a SAE 30 and some things but it's just not good up to a nice hot temp uh, we're in Illinois here so we get some some real hot temps during the summer so I can't believe that anyone would recommend running just a straight 30 weight we're gonna start with about a quart and a half Somewhere in there. I think we actually went a little bit over a quart and a half, maybe a quart and three quarter here. So hopefully that didn't overfill it. Check it here real quick. And boy, it's showing quite a bit up. Quite a bit up. Of course, we've got to account for the uh, four four ounces or so that are in the uh, filter. I'm gonna fire this. Up. If, you're, if you think you're extremely overfilled or anything like that, you definitely don't want to start it. You can blow out a head gasket pretty quick doing that. This thing should take about perfect. Yeah, so we came right back down. I'll wait for it to settle here for just a second and check it. Really, the best time to check it is when it's completely cold. So what we normally do is we get them kind of within range when we do our tune-ups. Uh, tag them, move them out. Uh, we pressure wash everything. Get everything cleaned up before they go out the door and then we check them the next morning before anything ever goes out of here we don't push anything out the same day uh, we always like to cold start everything uh, what we call the double check before we send anything out we double check the oil levels make sure they're all good and add when it's cold and make sure everything starts up cold and that doesn't matter whether it's a rider or whether it's a push mower now that's just a tiny bit overfilled it's about up to the F, so we're probably gonna have to pull a little bit out of that one. No big deal. Don't overfill it, don't leave it like that for sure if you do. I dumped just a tiny bit too much. I was shooting for about a quart and a half, which is about what these things take. And I went about a quart, quart and three quarters, so. Well, and then my And my pump wants to be nice and uncooperative here because it's full. I'm gonna dump him real quick. Got enough out of it there to start 
We're just getting the rest out of here. Now we're going to go up front and we're going to go ahead and sharpen the blades. Get those ready to go. And then I'll show you what else we need to do. Just goes to show you, it doesn't matter how many riders, how many anything you work on, you can and you will make mistakes. It's what you do about those mistakes that defines what you do. So uh, make sure you don't make a mistake and leave it that way. You know? All right, so up here, we've got a couple grease certs on the wheels. Zerks, I always call them zerts. I think it's because that's what my dad called them years and years ago. So we've got them on the axle on each side of your front. Other than that, there are no grease zerks on this entire mower. Those are the only two. There's none on the wheels. There's none on the uh, idler arm. There's none on any of the bushings. So I'll show you how to grease those without grease zerks here in just a second. Now we're going to use just a good old regular grease gun. Use the DeWalt battery powered. Makes it really easy as far as getting them done real quick. Just throw it on the fitting and they didn't take much grease. Go over to the other side. Alright. That easy as far as greasing goes. Uh, everything on this is sealed, which I don't particularly like, but it is kind of the way everything's going. If you like to find a place to jack up from, it doesn't really matter where at this point. Somewhere to, I'm not gonna be up there for long. I'm just trying to get it far enough up that I can get under the front of the deck. So that's where I like to jack it up from, is front of the deck. Just lets you get under it a little bit better. And we've got the parking brake on here, so it's going to pull it towards the back a little bit. No big deal whatsoever. We're a little bit far farther forward than what we should be for this. Yeah, so it, it normally pulls off. It'll pull the deck off backwards a little bit, which is what it did, which is why I start a little bit forward. I'm going to use a 5 8 We use an impact here to get the bolts off. See if I can't get us a little better view as I'm doing this. We're going to come down nice. one off and it is a lot easier to grease these wheels while you're up in the air like this just so you can find where the zerk is get this up it helps some people that one's got a pretty good ding out of it I think I should be able to save it, but definitely not ideal. I might actually contact the customer real quick, see if they want some new blades. These are pretty chopped up. I mean, I can sharpen them, but it's going to be one heck of a time getting that one out of there. People hit stuff pretty bad a lot of times. I will check with them real quick, and we'll either get these sharpened blades back on, or we'll get some new ones on. Now, if you sharpen them, you can use a file or something like that. Some people use grinders. You just want to make sure that you're you're balancing them afterwards. You get a lot better edge if you're using, um, I mean, a bench grinder. A lot of people will get a good edge with too. But as you see, it's really only the first three or four inches that cut the grass. The rest of it doesn't really do much except for kind of mulch or smash it up. So we'll be right back. Okay, so I was able to get right a hold of the customer. Customer said go ahead and replace the blades. So we've got a couple replacement blades on here. This is a 11821 rotary blade. They opted for the uh, straight cut, cheaper rotary blades. Now there's a couple different versions and stuff. These don't have a real high backspin or anything like that, but they're a pretty decent blade. What I like to do is start them. Get them all the way up, get everything centered against the top, and then go ahead and tighten it. That way you don't accidentally hit the lip, because there is a notch that centers them there. Okay, one on. Now for the next one. He's got a pretty big cutting edge on them. They got a little backspin to them, but they're not as 
as wavy as those other mulchers. You always have the flat side down towards the grass. You didn't know that much. And again, if you're sharpening these, you can take a file and run it all the way along the edge here. Um, get you a good edge on it. Just want to make sure you do both sides evenly. Uh, you can balance it. If you don't have a blade balancer, you can balance that on a uh, nail, even on the wall or into something. If it doesn't spin one way or the other, that's one of the best ways to do it uh, without having a balancer. Now we will. Now if you turn these around towards each other, you should see that they're both level at the edges. So when you're going towards the tips, they should line up. Now those are good. We're happy with those and the way they look. You can line up each one to each side. Good. You can also line them up to the outside edge. Oop. Pick a spot, say, oh yeah, right down here at the bottom. That's where it should line up. Bring the other side around. Well, it lines up to the same spot. So you know that uh, spindle doesn't have any play or anything in it. Now for the scraping of the deck down here, there's not a lot on this one, but we usually use just a regular old scraper. I'm not sure what happened right this very second. You can use just about everything if you don't have something handy. I mean, you can use a screwdriver, you know, anything. So get all this excess grass out from under it. A lot of times what will happen is around this edge here, there'll be a good, a good spot kind of like this. And that'll cause the blade to actually slow down eventually and stop if it's real bad. So again, this one has hardly anything under it. Really not much. A little bit up top here but if that edge is real built up or anything you should be able to see it you've got a bunch there make sure you get that off so again there's hardly anything in this one screwdriver got it pretty well clean and no time flat but scrape that real well if it's real dirty now from there what we'll want to do is we'll want to go ahead and air up the tires to spec now we've got just a regular air them up here it says the front tires are 30 psi max so we'll make sure those are good yep and they're actually a little bit high we're at 32 right now Oops, so that was at 32 then it jumped down real quick yep perfectly the other one here that's way high it's at 36 right now slowly falling right at 30 get him good and then we've got the back tires seeing what it's saying and 24 psi on the backs we'll just air both of those up to there okay 24 on this one I'm gonna go ahead and drop the front of the deck at this point so I can double check double check my uh, oil level again before I send it out the door Drop it back down to the jack stand, and then out over. Like such. All right, that's all down. Go ahead and grab this one to 24 real quick, double check that oil, and then from there all we have left is again, we blow everything off real good. We like to check our belts and everything while we're here make sure they're in good shape 
You don't want to do a tune-up and then send it back and have a belt go out right away. That's definitely never a good thing. So you can drop the deck at this point. Take a look at these belts. I don't see any cracks or anything in them. If you take it off the PTO, you can check and see how the idler pulleys spin. I mean, these things are, this thing's basically brand new. So I'm not going to worry too much about it. But we're going to blow all this grass off the deck here and then we're going to power wash it. We also like to make sure there's no grass built up down here or along any of the hydros. And especially not in the back of the engine or up underneath here. If it is, we want to go ahead and blow that off real good. Especially up underneath your fan also. Make sure it is 100% blown off and up, up above the clutch. So just make sure it's all free of grass and debris and stuff like that so you don't start a fire. If there's a bunch down here, your muffler is going to heat it up enough. It's actually going to catch on fire at some point. All right. So we've got the oil level. All right. Nice and good. All ready to go. So this thing is ready to go back to the customer at this point. As soon as we blow it off and power wash it, it's all ready to go. Hopefully that tells you how to tune up and service your unit. So I wanted to mention also, uh, I, I mentioned earlier that the unit didn't have any grease zerks up front or anything like that. There's a few points here that could use some grease. We use delayed viscosity penetrating grease by Kimball Midwest. Now any of these pivot points doesn't ever hurt to just give it a quick splash. Keeps it kind of lubed up without all those grease zerks there. It's not going to hurt anything. It's going to keep it from wearing away as fast. Now we don't like to do a ton of it. We don't want grass to build up too much around it as it will, you know, stick to anything greasy. But you do want it to actually be greased. So just any of the pivot points. I missed the other one on the other side up top there. Anything that pivots. And then we like to get on the inside on the idler arm both on the top side and on the bottom side don't get it on the belt you don't want it on there but anywhere where the thing's going to pivot you're going to want that grease that'll help keep your unit in good working shape for a long time so those don't pivot at the back that's all there is again thanks for watching like and subscribe